Hello and welcome to the In the Tank podcast, episode 204, the podcast that explores work of think tanks across the country. As always, I am your host, Donald Kendall, and joining me today, I've got a couple of fellas sitting across from me at the table is Big Jim Lakely, Director of Communications at the Heartland Institute. How are you today, good sir? I'm doing great. Glad to be on the show again. And also joining us via the interwebs, we have Isaac Orr, policy fellow at the center of the American experiment. Give it up for Isaac Orr. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and for those that are wondering, which is probably a very slim amount because the majority of our listeners are uh, audio only, but we are not doing a video podcast this time, so you might notice that our audio is better quality, which is a good trade-off. Uh, we had some technical difficulties last week that uh, didn't have the greatest quality of sound, so we wanted to make sure that that was all worked out. In the meantime, we'll go back to the trusty standby here at the Heartland Institute's Bob Chittister meeting room. So, yes, you should be able to hear the full breath of my, of my voice, and it should be sounding nice and crisp. So it's a good, uh, but it's temporary. We are going to go back to that, I hope. Maybe next week we will see. But uh, today, so we've got a few topics on hand. We're going to be talking about the potential blacklisting of climate change contrarians, and I put that in quotes. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about red flag laws. We're gonna, I, I think, Jim, just from our brief discussion about uh, what we're going to talk about this week, it seems like you have some pretty strong feelings towards those uh proposals so I'll, I'll challenge those and then uh, maybe we get into a little bit of uh, campaign finance disclosure laws towards the end here but um yeah usually i start off with a little bit of chit chat stuff uh i don't really know if i have anything planned let's just get to the meat and potatoes of this episode donald well yes and the meat and potatoes were supplied by you good sir i had a few other topics in mind uh stuff that we always talk about a little bit of uh Minimum wage and the modern monetary theory. <laughs> what, how often do I talk about that? Don't give me a hard like time. Like every day. Yeah. I'm pretty sure <laughs> if I asked your wife, she would just say that you mumble that in your sleep. <laughs> oh, no. Modern monetary theory. Tax to get rid of the extra capital and keep inflation from going up. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> all right, <laughs> fine. So yes, we were going to talk about that, but you uh, sent me a couple of articles, uh, a couple of links yesterday, so right in the nick of time to kind of radically change what we were going to talk about on this episode, which is this study that was done by, uh, was, it just, was it done by them or was it just published by Nature Communications? It was published in Nature Communications, okay. which, you know, Nature is supposed to be this very prestigious journal. Yes. Right. I, I believe the research was done by researchers at the University of California, Merced. Okay. So, well, how about that? I think go. they have a bullet train uh, being constructed yes, to there. good for them. <laughs> so. Oh, that's why they are so knowledgeable about climate. Yeah. They're on the front lines, man. <laughs> All right. So let me just kind of briefly read the abstract of this study here. And uh, I will let um, basically Isaac kind of take it from there. Uh, okay. So abstract. We juxtapose 386 prominent contrarians with 386 expert scientists by tracking their digital footprints across 200,000 research publications and 100,000 English language digital and print media articles on climate change. Projecting these individuals across the same backdrop facilitates quantifying disparities in media visibility and scientific authority and identifying organization patterns within their association networks. Here we show via direct comparison that contrarians are featured in 49% more media articles than scientists, yet when comparing visibility in mainstream media sources only, we observe just 1% excess visibility, which objectively demonstrates the crowding out of professional mainstream sources by the proliferation of new media sources, many of which contribute to the production and consumption of climate change disinformation at scale. These results demonstrate why climate scientists should increasingly exert their authority in scientific and public disclosure, and why professional journalists and editors should adjust the disproportionate attention given to contrarians. So basically, and Isaac, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, it seems like they went and took 
a sample size of contrarians and cl- uh, legitimate in their terms uh, climate change scientists compared the amount of media visibility that each get, and then they show that contrarians get a uh, relatively larger slice of the pie when it comes to media exposure. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, by the way, by their own weird definition of this, that is correct. <laughs> right. So, uh, I mean, feel free to elaborate on that and give me your initial takeaways here, sir. I just think it's very interesting that they found 386 probably more obscure scientists and counted how many media hits they got rather than talking about how many media hits does Leo DiCaprio get when he <laughs> talks about climate change. Greta yes. Thunberg. AOC, uh, Bill McKibben, like you have all of these people that know nothing about science, right? They just drink the Kool-Aid on this. And then they say, oh, well, these 386 obscure experts did not get as much print as as these contrarians, Uh uh, of which I am one. Uh, (laughs) You are on the list. (laughs) That's right. I am the only person on this podcast representing (laughs) the list. That is true. Uh, (laughs) And, you know, that's that's kind of a big honor. I'm a little mad. My boss, John Hinderocker, is on the list and he's a lot higher on it than me. So Mm -hmm. I like I kind of want to write into this the group at Merced and just say, hey, guys, why 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 the disrespect? Well, I I do want to mention because you kind of brought it up the how they selected the contrarians and the climate change scientists. So this is directly from their thing. It says we compiled a list of 386 contrarians by merging three overlapping name lists obtained by three public sources. The first source is a list of former speakers at the Heartland Institute's International Conference on Climate Change Conference over the period of 2008 to the the present, providing a representative sample across time. The second source is a list of individuals profiled by the the Smog Blog Project. And the third source is drawn from a list of lead authors of the most recent 2015 NIPCC report. Uh, so that's produced in conjunction with the Heartland Institute. So the Heartland Institute gets a lot of praise, or not praise, but uh, a lot of, uh, I don't know, they, they get talked about a lot in this uh, thing. I, I want my check. I think the Heartland Institute deserves a yeah. check from the University of California uh, system, in Merced in particular, because without the Heartland Institute, this study could not be conducted. <laughs> right. So I want my check. Uh, In comparison, the climate change scientists says that we ranked individuals' publication profiles according to their net citations. Blah, 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 blah. In this way, the climate change scientist group is comprised of the 386 most cited climate change scientists based solely on their climate change research. So it's just like kind of comparing those two things. So if you look at the contrarians list, it has uh, like politicians like uh, James Inhofe. It's got Rick Perry on there, Lamar Smith. Uh, It's got Rex Tillerson. It's got uh, John Stossel on there. And it's just like if you were to look, and I don't have the list of the the climate change scientists, but I can't imagine that they have like, you know, like you were saying, like the the Leonardo DiCaprio's on there. I can't imagine they have the Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's on there that talk about this stuff. The Jim Carrey's in there. Exactly. And the anti-vax people that live (laughs) in Hollywood. Like, let's talk about those people in here. Right. I want to start my own version of this study. Yeah. So it's just like if you were to cut out all of those people and instead just leave a list of these climate change scientists that people have probably never even heard of. Right. Oh, exactly. Then you're comparing apples to oranges. Yeah. You're, uh, Judith Curry said you're comparing peanuts to elephants. And exactly. I love that. Yep. Yep, that was a good one. <laughs> Peanuts to elephants. But Jim, yeah, uh, before I get into some of these other things that I want to talk about with this study, what are, what are your initial reactions to this? I mean, you should be flattered. I mean, this is really just highlighting the, the Heartland Institute as like the big dogs in this field. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, it's funny. They, they looked at the 2015 Climate Change Reconsidered volume. Uh, we've done another one since then, Climate Change Yeah, maybe we should mail fuels. a version of it to them. Uh, I think I'm going to look them up. They're going to get, <laughs> that uh, they're gonna get books. Great. That will be great. And so here, you missed some, and uh, it'll be a, like a 50-pound package on their door. Yeah. Um, no, but it's funny. Judith Curry, you, you mentioned her, Isaac. I mean, she, she has the very uh, popular, among uh, this subset of people that read stuff about the environment, blog <laughs> called Climate Etc., um, and she called Those this book learners with yeah. all the fancy website. That, that's right. That's right. Yeah, but Judith Curry, she, she's the um, she's retired now, but she's uh, recently retired. But she was the former chair of the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences uh, Sciences at Georgia 
uh, Georgia Tech. So she's a big deal, a big, uh, a big person in climate science. And she called this on her blog uh, the latest travesty in consensus enforcement, meaning mm-hmm. that the purpose of this paper is to um, otherize anybody who disagrees with the um, with the really disproven theory that human activity is causing a catastrophic climate crisis. Uh, but then she also says, this is the worst paper I've ever seen yeah. published in a reputable journal. <laughs> Nature Communications is supposedly a reputable journal. I mean, Nature is one of the biggest and most popular, even regular people have heard of the, the Journal of Nature. And so it's uh, she really got kind of mad about this. Uh, but yeah, Isaac, as you mentioned, she mentioned... Um, that the the list of climate science contrarians is heavily populated by experts in climate dynamics, i.e., people who actually know how the climate works, and uh, and she was actually a little bit ticked off that herself and uh, I saw a Twitter exchange between her and Richard Toll, and I know you know that name, a prominent scientist from Britain, uh, who's a bit of a gadfly, but uh, he's a very a very smart and very uh, free thinker on yeah. on climate issues, uh, but they were included in the in the. Uh, the contrarians, even though they are very well and respected published uh, climate scientists, so they, um, you know, they rigged it from all, all in every single different direction. And again, they mentioned people. They put people on this list like Mark Morano and Mark Stein and Nigel Lawson and Rupert Darwall, who are more and like Jim me- Lakely. Well, no, I'm not on that list because I didn't oh. list myself. Yes. <laughs> I didn't list myself because I didn't list myself as a speaker at our climate conferences, even though I get up there and speak. I listed John Noderf on that list, actually. And that's why he's, he's on, on this on list. The list. Yeah. Right. John Noderf is on, on the list. list. Joe Bass is on the Joe list. Joe Bass it's is on the list. A who's who of everyone who's not Jim Lakely. <laughs> that's right. That's right. But, you know, the, but it's funny. It's like also two of the experts, uh, two of the people on the climate contrarian list that they, you know, you put into this other list, people who don't know what they're talking about are um, uh, Ivor uh, Giaver, who is a Nobel laureate, mm. um, uh, physicist, uh, and he's a real Nobel laureate, not, not a fake Nobel laureate like Michael Mann, who's in the news every freaking week. Give me a break <laughs> with that. And then oh, also, right, yep. And, yep. And also Freeman Dyson, who's won every single scientific award you can think of, except for the Nobel Prize. Mm. And these people are, are supposedly just on the outside. They're, they're the others. They don't know what they're talking about. But again, as you mentioned, if this a, a real study, if they even wanted to do one, and this is a really, really fake study, um, would would compare the media attention, people like Al Gore, AOC, Greta Thunberg now. Yeah. She's 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 reported on globally every single day. Right. She's on her way on a on a I guess a sailboat to a, a UN conference in New York very soon. God, I, mean, I really hope it doesn't hit an iceberg. Oh, that would be terrible. Well, it is summer, so it's <laughs> unlikely. <laughs> but but the well, that's d- when they would calve, right? Because it's all about <laughs> well, the melting. You're true about yes, that's true. That's true. I Maybe mean, who it, knows? I mean, something. I, I, I say that jokingly, right? I don't wish her any not. ill will, but man, that would be poetic. <laughs> Gen- how about gently tapping a, an iceberg? Something that fell off Greenland would be really great. Oh my god! But but the, but the, <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's move on. No, no. But, but but the thesis, the idea that the media is is is, is giving too much press and airtime mm-hmm. to climate contrarians is so absurd. Well, the, the, it is like you, they talk about the 97%. 99% of all reporting on climate is all alarmist. It all, it all quotes Michael Mann. It quotes Al Gore. It sure. quotes Leo DiCaprio. I have to fight tooth and nail right. to get our scientists into the press yeah, is there days. any? This is absurd. Is there any climate contrarian uh, messaging getting out in like uh, – you know, the like the Academy Awards or the failing New York Times, like, <laughs> yeah. no, because right. those have all taken steps well, to limit our ability to even publish in their their publication. And the other thing that I want to like kind of want to mention, and I don't think that this study takes this into account, is like the uh, the way that it's covered. Right. So, like, you know, I could imagine that there is going to be some coverage where it's like, oh, you know, all these new study finds that ice caps are melting or whatever. And then these idiots over here say that it's not, you know, it's like, do they really, do they take into account like good coverage and bad <laughs> coverage? You know, they, they it's like, oh, that's a one for one right there. They, they both got coverage. That, that's <laughs> actually a fantastic point because the percentage of positive coverage for, for, for instance, our climate conferences um, and the NIPSI reports, the climate change reconsidered reports from the non-governmental international uh, panel on climate change it's almost uniformly negative. And in fact, um, you know, outlets, mainstream outlets like the New York Times and the Washington Post routinely mischaracterize what our scientists say, if they even want to report on what our scientists say. You know, when we first started doing these climate conferences back in 2009, 
Um, you know, the media ignored the first one. Then they got curious about some of the others that we had. And so they started to cover us like some kind of strange tribe that, you know, who are these, who are these weirdos who don't think, <laughs> who don't believe Al Gore? Who are these people? Isn't yeah. this funny? Look at these guys. And then they started to like, you know, mock it. And then they realized, oh my gosh, these guys are having some influence. This is, you know, now, then they started covering us as a dangerous threat. Um, to to society and to science, mm-hmm. and now they've gotten back to the point of trying to ignore us again. Um, so it, it's none of the coverage, unless you're talking about reading the Daily Caller or um, or very other few publications, the Washington Times, maybe the Washington Examiner, would actually. I'm not looking for positive coverage of Heartland's work. I'm looking for straight up neutral reporting on sure. what the scientists say, because when they give presentations with these slideshows and with graphs. And they cite their own work in the peer-reviewed literature. This is serious science, mm-hmm. but it goes against the narrative, and so it's either ignored or, if it's covered at all, it's downplayed and it's it's spun as negatively as possible. While Al Gore and the, and the rest and, and and Kenneth Tremberth and Michael Mann, these guys can get away with anything, mm-hmm. um, and they're never examined. Well, one of the things that they kind of like they, they frame a, a, a large portion of the discussion in this of like the idea of the. The kind of the political talk that kind of stems from all of this scientific literature and stuff like that. And I think that that's almost like kind of like the the red meat aspect for like the people on our side. I mean, like all the talk that I ever do when it comes to climate change, it all has to do in that field, that arena of talking about like how the solutions that are being proposed on their side are terrible. Right. You know, I don't get in there and I'm starting, you know, talking about the data points of February 2016 versus what that's beyond my my scope. So like if, you know, if outlets were to kind of take what the policy prescription is from this and actually limit the amount of exposure that people on our side of the the aisle are getting, then what is stopping from, I mean, how about you, Isaac? Like, wouldn't you be kind of worried that like the next study that you do that is a potential award winner, by the way, uh, you know, about like why carbon taxes are a terrible idea or electricity mandates are a terrible idea. And because of like the policy prescriptions of this report on nature communications are like telling you know big uh, uh outlets to not cover your stuff i mean you're a named person on here is that a, a legitimate concern for you uh maybe but the i think that the people who would actually take this to heart probably weren't gonna listen to my stuff anyway sure. right like i think that you know just thinking in minnesota i don't think that the climate reporter for npr but is was ever going to take me seriously regardless of whether uh, this, um, this thing got published or not, but she's the one that said, oh, hey, you don't have to worry about natural gas because Minnesota's wind is going to keep you warm in the winter time. And like such a stupid thing, especially because it was literally too cold for the wind turbines to go. Right. Um, so, you know, but I, it's almost I'm giving them a, like a justification at this point though. Well, like maybe it, they were, it is, but like they were, I don't think they were ever going to like entertain this seriously or not. So I think that the, the cool thing about this report is they said most of the recognition that they counted was not from traditional sources. Like mm-hmm. we're not going to win this battle by trying to get, you know, NPR to be nice to us once in a while. It's, you know what, we go on our own format. We have, you know, mm-hmm. our climate con- or Heartland has their climate conferences. They need to keep a little institutional difference here. Uh, <laughs> I thought you were at EIF, though, by the way. I didn't know that yeah, you were there. I nailed it. I nailed it. It was great. Um, yeah, no, you're right, though. It, it does bring up that distinction. I mentioned in the abstract that, like, if you were to take an all media uh, sources or whatever into account, that the discrepancy is larger than if you were to just look at the the mainstream, what they count, uh, count as mainstream sources mainstream. here. Mainstream. In the discussion section of this, I think it's corporate media. I think that's what we decided that we we're going to call it. Not mainstream. It's corporate media. I like legacy media, but you can work dinosaur on that. media. One of the I don't whatever. Lying fake media. News. Fake news. Fake news. That's right. That's right. Uh, so in the discussion section, it says indeed communicating authoritative information about the risks of an action is crucial for achieving global action. Yet sending informa- uh, uniform and a th- authoritative messages is challenging for various reasons. One reason is that climate change communication often requires strategically paring down this wicked problem for non-expert audiences. 
A related problem is the diminishing demand for expertise in scientific discourse aimed at the public. These problems are further exacerbated by the proliferation of new media, which democratize the production and consumption of information, making it increasingly challenging to identify trustworthy information. Unless countered by improvements to quality control management that can match (laughs) the production scale, this information deluge is likely to overwhelm the traditional safeguards on professional editorial oversight. So because people aren't going to the trusted uh, sources of news like the New York Times and stuff like that, then we're all just going to be awash in misinformation. So... This this just so we need to have our social media outlets vet articles yeah. to see whether they are true or not. Right, right. See this this is this is this points to the fact that um, environmental alarmism is a political movement, even among the scientists that that promote it. No doubt, that they can't they can't take dissent. They will not allow any scientist to dispute their quote unquote facts. Everything is settled because we have to act now. Despite the fact that even the United Nations, even the Paris Climate Accord, said that the difference between action and inaction is beneath the uh, margin of error for their predicted hmm. temperature uh, increase by the end of this century. So just that, even they, even they had to admit that because they have to have a scientific justification for all the nonsense in the Paris Climate Accords, it would do nothing. But they, but they want to do something. They want to control our societies. They right. want to control our energy economies. They want to tell us all what to do. And they cannot allow anybody to say, you know what? Your science has some problems. Because mm-hmm. that's what science is. Science is finding problems with other people's science. That's what practicing science right. is. But no, you're not allowed to do that in climate science. You're allowed to do it in medicine. You're allowed to do it in astrophysics. You're allowed to do it in astronomy. You're allowed to do it in biology. You're even, I mean, you're allowed to do it in every other scientific discipline except climate science for some reason. And why? There's a reason for that. Because if you knock out the knees from the the so-called consensus on climate science that human activity is causing a global catastrophe, if you knock the science out from under, they have nothing left. That is why you see papers like this trying to otherize and write these people out. The pressure is constant, and it's every day. This paper actually is just the latest Mm -hmm. in a long campaign to have this happen. Yeah. You know, and, and I I totally acknowledge that that that's the case. Uh, and again, kind of just coming from like the layman approach that I always take, and like you know, when I'm having like a discussion with friends or family or something like that, I'll I'll just like you know what, let's just concede that like you know the the climate change stuff is settled consensus or whatever. Like you know the solutions that are being proposed, and I assume that the the study doesn't really separate the two when it talks about kind of media exposure of these things, but like. You know, just last week, we were talking about Michael Moore coming to the realization that the solutions that are being proposed aren't going to do anything. You know, Bernie Sanders talking about how we could do all of the stuff that's in the climate accord, but it will mean nothing if China just keeps pumping out, you know, new uh, whatever. So it's just like, that's the discussion that I think has to happen. And if that's derailed because of the findings of this nature communications thing that says we have to actually silence those voices, then that, God, that scares me. I don't think it's going to silence anybody, though. I mean, no, this honestly, won't change. I think, <laughs> this won't I change think that it's just a list of people to interview if you're a conservative outlet. <laughs> and I think that's what's going to happen. Yeah, like, like next ICC, Jim, just go down this list of like, oh, I didn't, I, we never had this person. Let's I invite don't, them. I don't, I don't have to. Honestly, I, I think that's... I think there's literally three people on this on this list of 300 something people that we don't know or have had speak at our conferences. Literally, uh, we had two. I think the the number is 215 people have spoken at uh, Heartland's now 100 and, or I'm sorry, 13 international conferences on climate change. And then we have all of these reviewers, chapter reviewers and, and co-authors of the Climate Change Reconsidered books, mm-hmm. um, and that probably populates the rest. And so, um, yeah, that's why it's really, it's really an honor that without the Heartland Institute, this paper would not have been able to be made because that's how they find these people, because we have found these people. The, the purpose of the climate conferences that Heartland has put together now since 2009, for, for a decade now, has been to create a social network among, quote unquote, contrarian scientists. So you have this scientist, an astrophysicist, for instance, who's studying um, climate change in Australia. And then there's another guy working on the same problem in Germany and another person working on that in Brazil. They don't know who each other are. They've never met. 
And so we bring them together so that they can collaborate and meet each other and, and break down those barriers so that they can work and establish and produce better science, critique their own work. That's the most important thing that the Heartland Institute has done among the contrarians, so, so-called contrarians in the climate science space. And we will continue to do that with these 386 people and beyond. Mm-hmm. Isaac, any uh, final thoughts on this whole matter? Yeah, I was actually just going to say a final thought. Um, <laughs> we should really talk about the fact that they use Desmog blog as a reference <laughs> because, oh, my God, it's the toilet paper of the Internet, people. <laughs> if you go on to Desmog blog, I finally have a profile. Uh, and it's funny because I, the entire time I worked at Heartland, Desmog blog never thought it was worthwhile to make a profile for me. And as soon as I went to American Experiment, it popped up. So... I feel like they missed the boat a little bit, but oh my God, I love this. So according to Orr, this is from Desmog blog, uh, we shouldn't worry about climate change. Renewable energy subsidies must be eliminated. Fracking cleans the air. The U.S. was right to withdraw from the Paris Agreement and the health consequences of fracking are fabricated. Like I've said all those things, but when they take it out of context like that, it kind of sounds bad. (laughs) <laughs> right. Uh, Jim, do you, I, I, I bet you're just Googling yourself. Are you on Desmog blog? I, I actually, I, I did not. Oh, he is. Oh, I, I did. Yeah, but that's a relatively recent thing. I hadn't had one on there for a while. And now, gosh, they even have, they have my background. They say that I have a BA in English writing at the University of Pittsburgh. You know, go Panthers. That's awesome. And I'm director of communications. There's a, uh, oh, they got a, an appearance by me on Hardline with Ed Berliner. I don't even remember that. Uh, that appears. Yeah, they dig nice. up some stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, ooh, here's our special Heartland debriefing when we went to COP21. Oh, well, I could have dropped a few pounds there. That's unfortunate. <laughs> um, you know, but at least at least, the, at least my profile pick is is a, is a is one from about 10 years ago okay. and about 15 pounds ago. So that makes me feel good. So thanks, guys. I take this one personally. Okay, so John Noter, who is now famous for, like, selling Windex and, like, wet, wet wipes and stuff like that, he has a post on here. It says, No Derf co-hosts the Heartland Institute's podcast, In the Tank, with graphic designer Donnie Kendall, spelled with two L's. Oh, come on, oh, man. Oh, come on. Good. That is harsh. Well, I do actually, I do see on my entry here, and this definitely is new. Um, yeah, I denied media credentials to Mother Jones for our latest climate conference in Washington, <laughs> D.C. And I actually uh, sent an email, and, I, and she shared the email, and I wrote it because I knew she would share the email in an image. That explains that uh, Mother Jones, um, I have, there are standards that I have, and I've, you've, Rebecca Lieber had been to many of our climate conferences, but if you're just going to flat out lie about the Heartland Institute and smear the people we work with and have no interest in actually listening to what the people say, then uh, you're done. Or you can watch it online like everybody else. So thank you. Uh, one last blog. thing. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. that's it. They, they are a garbage website. Absolute garbage. They're garbage people. Um <laughs> The no, but the last thing I want to talk about yeah. is Pat Michaels. So uh, the the man has a PhD in climate science related fields, right? And like they just they just list his undergrad degree. They don't even talk about his graduate work at the University of Wisconsin. So mm. like this man who wrote a whole book called Lukewarming, which is great. Uh, you should read it if you haven't. But they just leave off credentials of people when it doesn't suit their purpose. So, mm-hmm. so to me, uh, everyone should write the smog blog and ask them, why don't you have uh, Pat Michael's PhD work on here? So I think I put in the title of this, uh, climate contrarians blacklisted question mark. And, uh, I guess this, as Jim kind of pointed out that this is not necessarily a new report. I mean, the, the report itself is new, but it's part of a kind of a longstanding push for this type of stuff. And I guess, Isaac, your contention is that, uh, this isn't going to lead to any further blacklisting that we've already have been experiencing. So I guess that kind of answers the question. That's how I feel about it, but hopefully it opens doors to other outlets that may not have, uh, even really thought about this issue before, so I you think sh- this could be useful. You should, uh, you should put in your Twitter bio or something like that, like Isaac Orr, uh, policy number fellow, number two forty one, number two forty one on the Nature Communications blacklist. <laughs> I'm right below Kevin Diarotna from the Heritage Foundation. Oh, oh Kevin's a new, he's, he's a new up and comer, so you know you better hurry and catch him. Yeah, yeah, come on. I don't you know how do often they update these power rankings. <laughs> 
Jesus. It's pretty great. Uh, all right, gentlemen, let's move on. Let's move on to the next topic here. Let's talk about red flag laws. So, obviously, after there is a tragic shooting in this country, there is a push for uh, we have to do something. Basically, it's it's a do something disease kind of magnified by current events. And uh, the latest thing, so I've got right in front of me, I got a couple of pieces, actually. The piece that I have in front of me that I'll use to kind of frame this whole conversation is a commentary piece from the Cato Institute titled Red Flag Laws and Their Awful Consequences. So uh, it says, yeah, renewed push for more restrictive gun laws. Uh, There's a couple of other things that are always kind of bandied about, but they usually fizzle out. However, red flag laws... Uh, Those allowing police to preemptively confiscate a person's firearms have exhibited the most staying powder, staying power. Uh, The orders resulting from these laws are known as gun violence restraining orders. Uh, While these laws certainly have reasonable basis, the way such laws have been implemented in many states poses serious legal and um, prudential concerns. The constitutional guarantee of due process is the most commonly cited concern in the implementation of uh, red flag laws. The first word due process, the first word of due process, legal process of due before the government takes someone's life, liberty or property, not after yada, yada, yada. It talks about how there was five of these uh, five states that had a certain version of these red flag laws. And now that is up to 17, including the District of Columbia. Um, and then it kind of goes on and, uh, I'll, I'll get to some of the kind of concerns that are presented in this piece here, but generally speaking, what are your thoughts, Jim? That the, it is very important to always resist the temptation or the, the calling to quote unquote, do something, Mm -hmm. especially in, in the wake of some, uh, tragic event, like obviously these, uh, the shooting in El Paso and the shooting in Dayton, Ohio, um, you know, and, and, and shootings all across the country mm-hmm. over the years. You know, we have 330 million people in this country. I think we have somewhere around 450 million firearms in this country. Um, you are not going to be able to get rid of them all. And in fact, if you think about the number of people we have in this country and the number of firearms that we have in this country, we should be having um, mass shootings like El Paso and Dayton on a much more frequent scale. And in fact, by population, uh, shootings shootings of this type are more common in, in Scandinavia than mm. they are in the United States. And nobody seems to uh, mention that very often or think that Scandinavia needs to uh, confiscate all guns. Sweden or Norway needs to confiscate all guns. Maybe they want to do that over there. But, you know, considering our population and the number of guns out there in private hands in this country, it should be happening more often. The idea of red flagging someone to try to stop them, at least starts the conversation where it should be, which is that this is a mental health issue. This is not a fire, a Second Amendment, I am allowed to have firearms to protect my property and my family issue. And so that conversation starting, finally, is a good thing. But um, the way they're going about it, at least, there really needs to be opposed because, you know, red flagging someone, who does the flagging? For what purpose, you know, for what justification do you have for that? Who makes the call? What happens then? Do you mm-hmm. do a, like, a, uh, like a SWAT raid on someone's house to take away their firearms? I mean, this is going down a very dangerous road. So the topic is something that's important to talk about, but the uh, sp- specifics of how they're talking about it is very troublesome. Yeah, and uh, feel free to jump in here, Isaac, if you want. Um, but I will mention some of these concerns that you have just presented there are reflected in this piece at the Cato Institute here. Uh, so it says that nearly all gun violence restraining orders uh, provide for the removal of a person's firearms without ever being given a notice. And many of these schemes, including California's, the confiscation order may be issued against someone completely unaware of any accusations underlying the order. Uh, first learning of the petition when the police arrive to seize their firearms. The process of issuing a a gun violence restraining order in most states starts with someone petitioning the court for it. States vary on who could bring up these petitions. In some states, only direct family members and dating partners could petition the court. Uh, in others, though, the list ex- is expanded to former dating partners, co-workers, or just friends. So I would assume that that's kind of like a hard thing to 
you know, like, oh, I'm a, I'm his friend. Yeah, you got to take his guns away. He's a crazy guy. You know, it's like, I don't know. It's kind of hard to prove. We're Facebook friends. That's proof. I don't know. Um, but uh, then it says the term red flag is something of a misnomer, too, as the suspicious activity can be the basis of a petition includes the simple act of buying a gun or just being interested in weapons. This turns constitutionally protected First and Second Amendment activity into the basis of a seizure of property. Uh, and then it kind of goes down. It talks about the confrontations between. Um, so, like, not only is you know trampling of due process, you know, one of the major issues here, but it says that the confrontations between police and unknowing individuals, seizure, uh, subject to seizure, can be a tense interactions for both parties. This has already claimed at least one life when officers shot a 61 year old man to death last year while serving a confiscation order. Uh, so yeah, the whole idea of swatting, like yeah. uh yeah, like calling like a like a you know uh, some type of threat on somebody, and then that results in the police going to that, has resulted in violence in certain cases, even though it's complete hoax in certain cases. So, so basically, like you can chalk this up. This whole article just kind of is painting what the worst case scenario is, right? An ex-boy or girlfriend reports a flimsy case against an ex-lover. The due process is superseded by a baseless claim, and then the police raid to confiscate guns leads to some type of violent outcome. So this is like the worst case scenario, okay? So, and I completely acknowledge all of that. Um, and I think that we could all pretty be uniformly against some type of rule that allows something like that to be able to happen. Right. I think that's a pretty safe thing to say. Sure. Um, however, the best case scenario, and this is presented in different articles that I was reading about. One of them was a national review article kind of talking about like the real life example of this Dayton shooter, right? Mm -hmm. And the Dayton shooter had, uh, supposedly he had a kill list of people and supposedly there was class members that reported that list to authorities. So if that was enough of a red flag to be able to have authorities come and confiscate whatever weapons that this person may or may not have had, you know, is that something that would be worth exploring these ideas? Well, it's easy to say that in hindsight, obviously. That's a very um, good point. And in fact, the Parkland shooter, um, you know, notoriously, talk about red flags. He, he was setting up red flags for years. And the, um, the authorities, the police, um, ignored all of them, um, and they could have maybe prevented the, the shooting at Parkland um, with a lot of actions short of confiscating the guns that, uh, that he took, I believe, from his mother. In fact, that's one of the, um, that's one of the hallmarks of these, of these mass shootings. It seems to be that more often than not, and I think much more, much more often than not, the, the shooters acquired their guns legally. You know, the so-called, um, you know, gun show loophole or, you know, this wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, all that stuff. All the laws that they want to put into place to prevent the next mass shooting as far as gun control would never almost almost never apply to that mass shooting. Right. And so um, and so now we're, we're trying something else. We're red flagging. And so so the question is, would it have been a good thing if the authorities had um, uh, confiscated the firearms of the shooter in Dayton? OK, Um Yes, in hindsight, that would have been great. But we don't live in, in uh, what was that movie by Tom Cruise? Minority Report, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. we don't live in that age. This, we don't live in Black Mirror, uh, where you can figure these things out. Um, there are interventions short of gun confiscation um, that can help solve this problem. Um, and the problem with this, again, and I think it's a much bigger problem, the, the, the scenarios you outlined earlier, where you can just, yeah, you have a disgruntled, you broke up with a guy, and um, you want to get him in trouble, so you flag him. You red flag him. Mm -hmm. I mean, the the abuse of red flagging, yeah, is is rampant. Michelle Malkin actually has reported on, on this for years on red flagging at the uh, Veterans Administration at VA hospitals that the bureaucrats in the VA, you know, flag problem, quote unquote, problem patients who then start getting in lots of trouble with the bu bu bureaucracy in many other ways, and so the. The opportunities for abuse of red flagging, I think, is is much greater than probably the the attempt at success. Because again, in Parkland, the Parkland shooting happened mostly as a as a failure of law enforcement, not a failure uh, anywhere else. And so they were flagged, they were informed about this kid, and they did nothing. The authorities did nothing about this kid for years, 
And so this idea that even if you alert the authorities through red flagging that they're going to do the right thing and prevent these things, I just don't buy it. Let me paint you a hypothetical. All right. So let's say in this hypothetical, there is a popular newscaster, okay? And uh, maybe he works for CNN or something, Mm. and uh, he is called a name at a public event. Okay. (laughs) And then in response to that name, he flips out and goes on an absolutely embarrassing tirade against the person that name called him, (laughs) all on video, all spread across the entire uh, internet and stuff like that. Should that person be allowed to own a gun? <laughs> I think Fredo should never have a firearm in his hand, just like the real Fredo. I don't think ever held a gun in The Godfather. As an Italian American, uh, sir, I am deeply offended by your usage of that term. So, um, by the way, that is on the Wikipedia's list of ethnic slurs as of like three days ago. All right, whatever, Fredo. <laughs> <laughs> so I bring that up because Donald Trump tweeted, would Chris Cuomo be given a red flag for his recent rant? Filthy language and a total loss of control. He shouldn't be allowed to have any weapon. He's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Isaac, you're a huge Trump fan. Do you think Chris Cuomo should be allowed to own a weapon? <laughs> I just like Trump's tweets. I'm not going to comment on on any of that. I mean... I- in all, and I think a lot of people are taking that tweet to be really serious, but I think even our friend Michael Malice would totally acknowledge that this is a complete troll job. <laughs> complete troll oh, job. for sure. I mean, how how is that anything but a troll job? Yeah. I mean, he is the best at it. It's like I was telling my friend this the other night. Like, that's his superpower. It's not even <laughs> that he's good at it. He's like a superhuman at it. <laughs> So it's amazing. I was actually uh, I was listening to his presentation or whatever. He did like some type of rally type speech in I think Pennsylvania uh, just the other day, and uh, he was mentioning like I was like, oh, if you really want to drive the left nuts, he's like, just do hashtag third term, you know, do hashtag fourth term. <laughs> <laughs> He was saying this during a rally. Like, he's completely aware of his effect on the media, and it's fantastic. Wait, POTUS said that? Yes, during a rally. Oh, I'll send you the video. My. It's hilarious. That is amazing. Yeah, it's so funny. <laughs> Next level trolling. <laughs> um, okay, so, but back to kind of the serious nature of these uh, red flag laws. So, uh, obviously, you know... Let me ask you it, a question, Donnie, actually, okay. since you've done a lot of reading on this. I just mm-hmm. want to... Has Have you come across a proposal for red flags that would eliminate the concerns I have, or at least mitigate them in a major way. Mitigate them in a major way, yes. How? Okay, so uh, they, wh- what's that, Dan Crenshaw? Yeah. He He was just recently on the Crowder uh, show mm-hmm. and where he referenced a thing. So I, I, I've got the thing that he referenced here. This is testimony uh, written by David Coppell, who is a adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute and a research director at the Independence Institute. Yeah, we know Dave, yeah. And uh, he did testimony in front of a full committee hearing, uh, yeah, Senate Judiciary Committee, and where he kind of talks about several different things that would have to be in place, pretty much ironclad, mm. um, to kind of get around some of the concerns that you know people should rightfully have. So here's just kind of a list, right? And uh, so petitions initiated by law enforcement, not by spurred dating partners or relationships from long ago. So he was pretty adamant about this idea that these these um, gun violence res- res- restraining orders or whatever would have to be uh, uh, asked by law authorities. That's right? slightly that's slightly better than spurned lover uh, red flag, but I'm right. still it's still not far enough for me. Keep uh, going. Um uh, let's see. Hearings when only uh when there is a proof of necessity, uh proof by clear and convincing evidence which has to be corroborated, so it can't just be you coming up, you know, trying to get me, you know, my guns taken away. It's got to be corroborated. Uh, guarantees of all due process rights, including cross-examination and the right to counsel. So this would kind of get rid of that idea that, like, you know, you could be, oh, this is the first I'm hearing of this as the SWAT team is busting down your door. Uh, Court-appointed counsel if the respondent so wishes. Um, A civil remedy for victims of false or malicious petitions. So this would be, you know, in case 
you know, you just did it out of spite to try to take my guns away or to put me in potential harm or whatever, that if it was just because of that and there was no actual reasoning for your petition, that you could be held liable in some regard. Pro- prove that, by the way. Prove that I didn't do it out of spite or I did it out of spite instead of a real concern, Donnie, that you are nuts. Well, the, th- <laughs> the thing is, the threshold for for them to actually carry out one of these restraining orders would have to be to in a certain probably provable thing, okay, right? Fine. Uh, a safe and orderly procedures for le- relinquishment of firearms, strict controls on no-knock raids, storage of rel- relinquished firearms by responsible third parties, prompt restoration of concealed carry permits for falsely accused, uh, prompt return of firearms upon the termination of an order, renewal of orders based on the presentation of clear and convincing proof, uh, and yeah, so... So it's basically the safeguards, and now even with that, and I know I've been kind of playing devil's advocate here, even if we were to get all of these safeguards in, in place and you know we we're trying to do this, I know that the slippery slope, that if something were to happen, it was like only because these, these red flag laws were so strict that we weren't able to prevent this, I think that you would see a natural degradation of these standards if these were put into place. So I will acknowledge that. All right. Well, see, there's, there's, I think the model for this is the, um, you know, the restraining orders, say, uh, abused um, wives or abused women get for their boyfriends or husbands that batter them. And, th- and that's a great thing, and that happens. Mm-hmm. And there isn't any due process uh, right away. It's just the, the guy is removed from the home, and, um, and then they'll figure it out later. The pro- um, the pro- one of the problems here is that the right to own firearms to protect yourself and your family is in, in, is in the Constitution. It right. is an unvoluable right. right. You are permitted to have this. And so to leap that hurdle, to violate my constitutional rights that you have to really jump high mm. for that to happen. And another problem with this, and then those things make me feel only slightly better about these things. Sure. One of my problems is that I don't, you know, you can't trust the police and the bureaucrats to figure this out and to do it right. Um, there, At least there's talk now of do, some kind of due process, mm-hmm. which is better than just throwing up a red flag. Yep, yep. But there's also the case that it would never stop here. Once you start down a road like this, you always keep going. The exactly people that advocate yep. these laws always want more. Um, that's why they talk about the gun show loophole. I love the idea that there's a loophole in the law, especially when a member of Congress says it. Hey, dummy, you made the law. <laughs> it's not called a loophole. It's called I'm following the law. All right. And now you want to rope me in and um, say I'm violating the law. And you, so you call it a loophole. No, it's the law, and I'm following it. And now you want to restrict my rights or stop me from doing what I'm doing that, I don't know, a year ago, two years ago, you didn't think it was worthy or bothersome to um, what I was doing was such a bother that it sh- I shouldn't do it anymore. And so that's the problem with this. That's, that's the, actually probably the main objection myself and many other libertarians have with this sort of thing is that it never stops. If you agree in principle, if you accede to the idea that we need red flag laws to protect us from mass shooters, you are giving us up so much ground that you are now continuing down this road for more violations of your um, constitutional rights when you are innocent and haven't done anything. And again, in the context of the number of firearms in this in this country, of the number of people in the United States, and then if you took it on a per capita ba- basis, we are actually not the worst in the world on this problem. That tells me no. Mm-hmm. We're, I, sh- I don't think we should do this at all. Isaac, any last words on this before we move to our last topic of discussion? Did I lose you? Isaac, you there? Did you mute yourself? Oh, well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I, I had muted my... I thought I'd muted myself when I was typing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just busy tweeting at the people who wrote this study, letting them... Asking them when they'll be updating their power rankings. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, speaking of rankings, uh, before we get to our last topic... And, and, oh, and, uh, snap. One more, one more uh, mention here. For all the people that are listening and they're writing their angry email to me uh, for just presenting some of these ideas, just like... Just like let the email sit for an hour before you hit send, yeah. and, and maybe kind of re- self uh, self edit after that hour. But you know, whatever. Let the passion of my voice and the red <laughs> face you could not see while yelling at yeah. Donnie stand in for you exactly. for now while right. you wait. I don't what, need any hate emails. And what's the email again, Donnie? Uh, in the tank podcast at gmail dot com. All right. So speaking of power rankings, uh, so we've talked about our Democratic candidate survivor pool here. We got another one biting the dust, uh, Mister Hickenlooper. 
has dropped out, who was my, I think, third round pick. Maybe. That is correct, your third round pick. Third I'm round pulling pick. it up now. So that uh, gives me 23 points, and as our thing is kind of organized, the less points, the better. So I am now behind two people, Isaac and our producer extraordinaire, Andy, who are tied in first place. Nobody dropped out. So Hick and Luber, WTF. You were supposed to stay in. You were the guy that was actually talking about how we don't need socialism. I thought that you would have a little more staying power, but apparently not. He says we don't need socialism. How long did you think he was going to last? <laughs> I know, especially in the primary. In this primary, sure. It's such a bad idea. <laughs> uh, he was actually your fourth round pick. If that fourth makes round pick. It does make me feel a little better. So I guess the question is, who's next? Who's going out next? Isaac, you got anyone in mind? Who do you think is going to drop out next? Hmm... I still think Komashar is gone. Klobuchar, Maybe that's yeah. just me hating my own team. But uh, <laughs> I think she's actually like at what one and a half percent according to the Real Clear Politics aggregate poll. I think she's been living in Iowa, to be honest. Like Probably. I don't even think she lives in Minnesota anymore. I think she lives in Cedar Rapids. O- overdosing on like the the bacon wrapped uh, corn dogs uh, that they give at those <laughs> the, the fair or whatever. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Jim, who, who's dropping out next? Who well, do you think? I guess we'd have to see. When, when is the next debate? Is it? it it's not until uh, so like early September. Early September. So that's only a few weeks. I guess. I guess you know we'll find out. Whoever doesn't make the stage, because I know they're cutting it down. I don't even know what their criteria are, because I don't care that much. <laughs> but um, I, you know, I, I think Gillibrand is probably the next one. The next of the bigger names. I mean, you can say Seth Moulton. Who? Who's that guy? Uh, Michael Bennett. Who's that guy? I mean, nobody knows who yeah, these yeah. people are. Kirsten Gillibrand has some name recognition. I think she's. Um, more likely than not to go out. I'm still thinking Beto. I think Beto is going. Ugh. I mean, he's hitting a wall here. He's, he's just trended downwards. Now he's resorting to like uh, live streaming and trying to change a tire and stuff like that. I think he is uh, running out of steam. If, if Beto goes out, I'm in big, big <laughs> trouble. <laughs> All right, All right um, I'm cheering for him now. Yeah. Last topic of discussion, gentlemen. This actually kind of ties into this discussion here because uh, so this piece is from the Goldwater Institute in Defense of Liberty blog. And this is an article titled Castro Weaponizes Campaign Finan- Finance Disclosure Against Ordinary Texans. So uh, I don't know how to pronounce your name, Siri. Uh, sorry, sir. Um, Joaquin. Castro, twin brother of the Democratic presidential hopeful Julian Castro, who I actually drafted third, I think, uh, uh, (laughs) painting targets on his city's own citizens in a recent tweet. In it, he names 44 San Antonio residents who donated a maximum amount to uh, President Donald Trump's re-election campaign. So... um, The author of this kind of contends that uh, it must be an intimidation thing to try to basically uh, a chilling effect to try to prevent people from actually donating money, because then there's the concern that you're going to be outed and, and, and retweeted across the Twitter sphere and with your name out there and the whole doxing concern and stuff like that. But I think what he unknowingly did is completely illustrate what the concern was against people that had uh, that the, the concerns that people had about campaigns finance disclosure, which is this is just going to be used to uh, to demonize and ostracize, uh, you know, people that are donating to specific causes. So I think he actually did these people a favor <laughs> unknowingly. What are your thoughts on this, Jim? Well, you, uh, you remember just about, I don't know, five minutes ago when I said the problem with gun laws is that it never stops. It just keeps going the other direction. You can make the same argument about campaign finance laws. Right. I think one of the worst laws passed in the last 25 years is the so-called McCain-Feingold campaign finance law, mm. um, which basically came about, again, because of something that has nothing to do with us. <laughs> yeah. But John McCain was implicated in the Keating Five scandal. And so to clear his name and to clean up his reputation, he became a uh, a champion for campaign finance reform. It's like, hey, hey, buddy, how about you just don't break the law? Why do you have to come down on everybody else? And that law actually is a, that law actually is directed at the people and not at the politicians. And so, you know, there's a Supreme Court decision in 1954, I believe it is, and uh, it involved the NAACP, I think, versus the state of Alabama. And it, it ensconced in law and in that Supreme Court decision the right to donate anonymously right. to avoid um, harassment yeah. and, in some cases, physical threats and maybe even death. If you sure. contribute to the NAACP and you live in Alabama in, 19, in the 1950s, you're putting yourself personally at risk for doing so. And so 
that that that's one reason to be able to donate anonymously. And then now in today's world, another one is just not to be bothered. You should not have to sacrifice your uh, your livelihood. Mm-hmm. You should not be risking your livelihood or 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 your the peace and comfort of your home just because of your political beliefs and who you want to support. In my mind, campaign finance reform laws, all of them should be just thrown off the books. People can figure out on their own whether they like a candidate or not, and it really doesn't matter how much money they have or, or, or collect. You can, have a, you can report how much money you have and how much money you're spending, but you know, the, the, the conceit, the idea that a politician only um, uh, espouses a certain policy position because of the money he got right. for that is, is, is wrong. It's not, it's not necessarily the case. It could be, but it's probably not. Most of the times, for whether it's a nonprofit organization or a politician, the money follows the policy right. that you donate to this candidate because you support his policies. You don't donate to this candidate and say, adopt my policies. It doesn't work that way. It's, it, the transaction goes in the reverse. Yeah, so basically, if you donate any money to a nonprofit that supports some type of measure or something like that, some type of candidate, your name could wind up on a government list and then be exploited for political purposes by other politicians, apparently. Isaac, do you got... Uh, an opinion on this whole ordeal yeah i mean i get why people would prefer not to be named like this because you know obviously it is kind of an intimidation tactic Absolutely. like even when even when we had that episode about geoengineering from in the tank and those guys were like quoting us yeah i was like oh man wow people actually listen to this i better be careful with what i say from now on <laughs> um, yeah you've really adhered to that isaac <laughs> <laughs> right, that's what I was just thinking. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, this is me dialing it back. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah, so, go back and listen to those but, first episodes where he had no restraint on himself. I think it does have a chilling effect, and I think you'd be crazy to think that it doesn't. Yeah. Um, whether that is just going to become the new normal or not, and you know, I think it'll lose its its value if you continue to use it. Um, but yeah, I do think that it was it was meant to intimidate. Yeah, I I just kind of it blows my mind. Like I think this happened at the beginning of the week or maybe late last week, and like it's just like completely gone off of like anybody's mind or anything like that. And like to me, this was like a pretty big story right here, especially because like he like misnamed some people. So like there could be theoretically people that weren't even donating that are getting harassed because they were on this list. It's just like I don't know. It's a very kind of scary thought, and I just feel like, and this is kind of an easy thing for me to say, but. I feel like if this were the other way around, like you would never end uh, hear the end of it. What do you mean the other way around? Like if this was some, like let's say you know they in this article they bring up the idea of like abortion or something like that. Like if some anti-abortion group uh, published the list of names of people that were donating to a pro-choice organization or something like that, like. I feel like they would be demonized for like now until the end of election season by their own side, let alone the other side. Right. I mean, this is just not it doesn't seem to really be in the DNA of liber- certainly not libertarians, but sure. people generally on the right. They kind of don't think this way. They don't think it's actually proper. Um, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't encourage honest discourse on public policy in right. the country to, to engage in these kind of wars, these kind of exposure and troll wars. You know, but uh, Castro, I think he actually outed some of his own donors yeah. uh, by accident. And I think those donors are probably like, screw off. <laughs> You're not getting any more my, of my money. So, you know, he stepped on a rake a little bit there, but it still doesn't make it right. Yeah, I don't know. It's just like whoever is kind of uh, explaining their hesitation for these these types of laws have a ironclad example of how it could be misused. So um, and I guess that kind of ties into what the red the red flag laws, too, and how those could potentially be misused. So. That's just kind of the unintended consequences of all government action that we all have to keep in mind when talking about policy and stuff like that. Gentlemen, that's all I've got for today. Does anyone have any stories or anecdotes or jokes or anything that they want to, maybe words of wisdom they want to impart on our audience before we sign off for the for the week? I'll just say a couple things. Okay. And I will say that um, we've just confirmed this week that uh, the great Glenn Beck Ooh. is going to be the keynote speaker right. at Heartland's 
um, uh, 35th anniversary benefit dinner that's going to be uh, in Palatine. I'm sorry, it's going to be, yes, in Palatine, Illinois, which is uh, a town or two away here from Arlington Heights, Illinois, at a place called the Cotillion. Which Subject is matter, met. stopping socialism. Subject matter, stopping socialism, something very close to your heart, uh, Donnie, I oh, know yeah. that. And so that's going to be on October 4th. Go to heartland.org for more information and get your tickets or table today. Isaac, what you got? Well, I'm just wondering why you didn't have Justin do the uh, the event if it's about stopping socialism. He, he's oh, wait, introducing. No one would come. <laughs> he's introducing them actually, <laughs> so he'll have uh, some minutes on stage up there. Well, yeah, they're actually buddies now, aren't they? Oh yeah, yeah they are. best yeah. friends. Yeah, I think actually yeah. Justin might even be doing a you know a little 15 minute you know soft shoe on on stopping socialism himself before he introduces right. uh, Glenn. Oh, uh, I'm I, sure that'll be the worst part of the evening. <laughs> <laughs> Isaac, uh, <laughs> any update on your potential Bob Williams award-winning study? Do you uh, win- no, voting closed. Thank you for everybody that did vote for our study. I think that we have a really good chance at winning um, because we have this picture of our governor and AOC, and every time we link to it on our Facebook, the post goes uh, nuclear. So nice. thank you for everybody who uh, who voted for us. All right, fantastic. All right, uh, gentlemen, that will do it for today. Thank you all for tuning in for this episode of the Intake Podcast. Tune in every Friday for a new episode. If you like our show, please write a review for us. Subscribe on iTunes. That would be greatly appreciated. You could also find us on SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, pretty much everything nowadays. Hopefully next week, even YouTube. If you would like to follow us, you can on Twitter at InTheTankPod. If you want to send us your comments, suggestions, questions, anecdotes, whatever you'd like, feel free to email us at InTheTankPodcast at gmail.com. Jim, where can the fine people find you? At Jay Lakely on Twitter, and you can find Heartland Institute at Heartland Inst. And same question to you, Isaac. Where can the fine people find you? At the fracking guy on Twitter. Still still rocking that hashtag or that handle. Nice. And at AmericanExperiment.org. Thank you all for listening, and we will talk to you next week. 